Okay, let's start. So first of all, mastery. If you, so the mastery column has been updated since exam, since attempt two. If you have a 90, you pass on exam, on attempt two. If you still have a zero, that means you have not passed yet. So from here on out, you're going to have to come to office hours to take uh, mastery attempts three, four, and beyond. But hopefully there's no beyond. Okay? So we want to we want to pass it to your screens, screens, screens. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, anybody's office hours from here on out. If you still have a zero in the mastery column, you have to get in and pass it. Um, and again, you have to get ninety percent of it correct. Any questions about that? Okay. We have exam three. It's a week from Thursday night. And then the final is the following Tuesday. So there's a, there, is a, there is a good thing to that in that for, in studying for exam three, that'll be, that you can think of that as studying for your final two because it's less than a week away. So that's the, that's the benefit to that. There's not, there's, we don't have a bunch of material in between. In fact, there's none, right? That's the last day of class. So that's the good thing about that is you can study for exam three and the final simultaneously because we're, we're less than a week out from the final. Yes. We are. We all pick up the the camp wheel that day, right? Right. If you again, if you have the conflict, we'll we'll do the same procedure as last time, and we'll we'll figure out alternate time to take exam three. Watch for the email. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I use. I haven't. So anything I offer would be offered to everybody first of all. Um, but so no, the really important thing is that you'd spend all your time studying for exam three, instead of instead of putting some attention to an extra credit project. Exam three is a big chunk of your grade, and the final. I'll explain on Thursday how the final works. I've I've made it some percent of the of the total grade, but it can be worth more too. So we really really want to focus all our attention on exam three and the final, rather than diverting it to an extra credit project and then doing more poorly on the exams. That's going to be your overall grade will end up lower than it did higher. Uh, it's going to be both. It's going to be everything. It's going to be similar to the similar to the exams. It'll be conceptual and uh, solving problems. Yeah, problem solving. Okay, so I have uh, extended today today's web work till. Uh, so then you'll have you'll have two sets. You'll have a, this set and the new set due Monday at, or Thursday at 1. So, um, and I gave three more attempts on all the problems. I just made it a total of eight attempts. Do three more on every problem. And uh, I want to do this one. I'm going to do number 11. This had a little, pr pretty low success. And I want to do this one. And I want to, there's two ways to approach this. Um, and so I'm going to talk about both of those. But I want to take a, a trig approach. So we just at least talk about trig, because trig is important. And lots of those questions have trig. It could be on the third exam and the final. All right, so a, three, a fence three feet tall runs parallel to a building at a distance of six feet from the building. Did I start this when I was, wasn't even looking? Did I start the video and not remember? Did you see me start the video? Okay. It's nice to play black period in my life already. All right, so a uh, fence three feet tall runs parallel to a building at a distance six feet from the building. What's the length of the shortest ladder that will reach from the ground over the fence of the wall to the building? Remember we emphasized last week, understand the situation. Don't just get into the mindset of, okay, what do I do to get an answer? This is what, this is the, like the biggest problem we see that students have, is they're immediately into, all right, what am I gonna do, how do, how, how what steps will I take to get the answer to the problem? So forget about that and say, I want to start by understanding what's going on. Just getting a visual image, making a picture of it, and really understanding the quantities involved, what quantities are changing, how they change together. Remember, we gave you that kind of protocol for this. OK, so we've got a building.
we've got a building like this. And then we have a fence that's, what, six feet from the building, and it's three feet tall. So maybe it's something like this. And so it, the, it runs in and out. It's parallel to the building, so that the fence is running like in and out of the screen. Okay? And so we need a ladder that reaches from the ground over the wall and reaches the building. So can you imagine what they're talking about there with the ladder? So it's going to start from the ground. It's going to go over the wall and... So this is the idea of the ladder here. Okay, so what? So now let's talk about this. So we kind of understand the situation. We got to figure out what's the shortest what the shortest ladder that will reach from the ground over the over the fence and and make it to the building. So, all right, what quantities are involved? So let's. Brainstorm here. What quantities do we have involved in this? And again, by quantities, we don't mean just numbers, values. We mean uh, quantities like temperature, distance, velocity, volume, mass, weight. Those are what we mean by quantities. So what quantities are involved? It's just, what's that? Height of the fence. Height of the fence. Constant or changing? Constant at three feet. So we have that, that constant quantity. What else do we have? Distance to the building. What distance of what to the building? From the building to the wall. To the wall. Distance from the wall to the building. Constant or changing? Constant. So those were given as constants. All right, what else? What other quantities do we have involved here? Okay, he said the length of the ladder. So the length of the ladder, we'll call it capital L. Constant or changing? So why is it changing? We'll see that in a second, all right? And you said angle. What angle are you seeing? This angle right here? Okay, this is an is that that angle measure. Is that constant or changing? Changing, right? Changing, okay. Other potential quantities involved here. Yeah, sorry. Um, the distance from the wall to the end of the ladder? Distance from the wall to the end of the ladder. Like this one. Yeah, or the, yeah, from the building or the wall. Either one. Oh, you choose. What did you say originally? Uh, I said from the wall. I said the wall, okay. And then you added the six feet to the building. Constant or changing? changing? Another changing quantity in the situation. All right, so maybe we call that X or something like this. Anything else? I see somebody new. I see one more quantity that might be important. What's that? The height of the whole building? Okay, yes. So the height of the whole building is a quantity. It's a constant quantity. We don't know how tall it is, but uh, we just kind of assume that it just goes up as tall as it needs to be. But maybe a little more relevant would be the height from the ground to the top of the ladder. Maybe we call it H. So how is it that we get different lengths of ladders at different angles? So can you, so we so we need to imagine imagine the scenario for so what quantities are changing? The ones I made variables for? H, X, L, and theta. And can you imagine how those change together? Can you imagine how those change together? And that's important, right? That's important. And so because there's different x values we could pick. And for different x values, we get different lengths. And we get different angle theta. And we get a different height where the ladder hits the wall. So let's <clears throat> OK, so, so I got the wall here in. Oh, brother.
Okay. So here is if we uh, had a ladder that that touched the ground way, way out to the right, way, way, way out to the right. And so then if we pull that in, do you see how the length of the ladder changes as the angle changes, as the height that the ladder hits the wall, or the building changes, as the distance to where the ladder touches the ground changes. So we've got all those four quantities changing together. And so do you see this is a longer ladder than this one? And then if we let that, that angle get large or that X get, you can imagine that the ladder would get really, really long as, as we moved the base of it closer to the fence. Again, it would be very, very long that way and it would be very, very long this way. So somewhere in there is a shortest ladder. Somewhere in here is a shortest ladder. And that's what we're trying to find, the shortest ladder that would extend to the building. Okay, so I'm going to, to use, I'm going to, uh, so you have a trig example, so, so there's two ways to do this. You can set up similar triangles. Now before we even get to that, what's going to be, so now we understand the situation, we got a lot of quantities we've talked about. So theta, total length of the ladder L, I called this X, I called the height H, like this. Got all these quantities. So what's going to be the centerpiece of the solution that we're about to do? The centerpiece of the solution. The whole, everything we do from here on out to get the answer is going to be primarily about one thing. Tell the person next to you. What one thing is it going to be about? Okay, so in one word, if you had one word, what would the, the primary centerpiece of the solution be? In one word. In one word, what, what is it going to be? The centerpiece of the solution. Please know this. Yes, please. Thank you. A function that you, you should have been thinking. A function is the centerpiece of this. Now let's be more specific. What function is it? So what function, what about this function is important here? Cool. Uh, the like no, nope, that's not the key feature of the function. What's the key feature of this function? I know that Levi knows. Trevor. What's that? How does the length of the ladder relate to that function? It's the... Yeah. The dependent variable. The output or the dependent variable of the function is length of the ladder. So we we need a length function. So I'll call it f. And I'm gonna so there's different ways to do this. You could make it a function of what I've shown x, but I'm gonna do it as theta so that we get some trig practice here. And we talked about trig a little bit, because you have other ones that are trig. Alright, so and this is gonna be the length of the ladder. The whole solution is going to revolve around this function whose dependent variable or output is length because we want to max or we want to minimize the length. We want to minimize the length. And I'm going to choose my independent, it's, it's going to choose it to be dependent on theta, the independent variable. Okay, so let's just start. How am I going to get length? So as a kind of as a starting point, the structure of the length is going to be, I'm going to choose to structure that length quantity as broken up into two lengths. So we'll call L1 and L2. Why? Because I want to I want to bypass H and X altogether. If I if I do something to do with with H and X, then I've got to get these relationships and get rid of the H and X. I just want theta. So I can I can get I, 
kind of fast track to just using theta by uh, instead defining L in terms of L1 and L2. So what will the structure of this function be? How will I just, the, in the general structure of my function to get capital L will be what? Now that I've broken it up into these two pieces, L equals L1 plus L2. And that's what you want to do when you start building this, this key function in the problem. You want to think it, don't, don't try to write, it per, write the final result the first time. Start with just the formula, whatever the formula is for L, or the structure of it. And just, and just make it easy on yourself at first. So this length of the ladder is the, the part of the length to the right of the three foot uh, fence, and then the part of the length to the left. Okay, so. We've got what we've got, and we need to get this now in each of these in terms of theta, and then we've got the function. And so I can, I don't have to use x and h to do this. So look, L1 in terms of theta is a matter of this triangle right here, and I already know this side right here, 3. So what is the side 3 relative to theta? That's the opposite side. And what is L1 re related to theta? OK, so adjacent would be the leg, right? This would be adjacent. So this is the hypotenuse. So what, which of your trig uh, functions brings together opposite, hypotenuse, and angle? You should know the sign. So sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is? Adjacent over hypotenuse, tangent, opposite over adjacent. I'm going to need these. What's that? Just miswrote. Thank you. OK, are we good? So to get L1 in terms of theta, I'm going to use which one of these again? Sine, right? Sine of theta is going to be, for in our case, I'll just do it in blue, it's going to be 3 over L1. And so if sine of theta equals 3 over L1, then L1 equals 3 over sine theta. OK, L2. So L2, then we can look at this triangle right here. And this angle is also theta. And what do I know on this? I know that this right here is 6. Which side relative to theta is that? It's the adjacent leg. The adjacent leg to theta. So we're going to use cosine. And I'm going to have adjacent 6 over L2. is cosine theta, therefore L2 is? OK, so that, that's the function. So we've got kind of two ways to go here. Oh, no, so, we're, so then we also need the, the boundaries. The limits of, so theta varies from what to what? So what's the smallest possible value of theta we can think of that makes sense in the situation? Zero. So as x gets larger, theta gets smaller, right? It's a more and more horizontal ladder. So we really can make x kind of infinitely large, meaning that theta would be approaching what value? Zero. Let me do that. So if you imagine x getting larger and larger, do you see that theta is getting smaller and smaller? So if x could be infinite, theta would be 0. OK, and then what's the largest theta could be? So we imagine this here. 
And as that continues to get closer and closer, we might get a ladder that looks like this. For some reason I couldn't get GC to, to do this, but can you imagine the ladder being like that? So then what, there's our angle there. So what's the maximum theta could be? Is that pi? Yeah. Pi over 2, right? Or 90? Now there's, so what did we say? We said that uh, maximums and minimums can occur at one of two places, right? Or there's, to, to get our list of possible candidates for max or min, we look at two different things. First thing we look at is endpoints, right? Endpoints. So in some of these, lots of these problems, the endpoints, we can see right away that they're not, it's not, what, what happens when theta is close to zero? How, what's the ladder like? You see that it's super long, right? And what happens when theta is close to pi over 2? Again, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go way high, high, high up in the sky until it, it, before it hits that building, right? So these are going to, getting closer and closer to zero means a longer and longer ladder. Getting closer and closer to pi over 2, uh, likewise, means a longer and longer ladder until it touches the building. So we can, we can reason that the, the endpoints here are giving us infinitely long ladders. So, it, if, so this, this minimum length of ladder we're expecting at a critical value, right? So, so that our, our possible candidates are endpoints and critical points. So the minimum we're expecting at a critical point. Okay, and this you also you often see situations like this where when you're trying to figure out what the dependent variable can be, these these end situations they just they don't make sense in the situation. Like you would it, it gives you like zero volume or an infinitely long ladder, and so that happens a lot. And so then the critical points are going to be what we're interested in. So to get the critical points, how do we get the critical points? Places of local maxes and local mins are where first derivative is zero. And we talked about why. You get a pause, right? A pause in this function will be a potential high point or potential low point. So in order to do it, let's practice our, uh, our rules here. Let's make this 3 cosecant plus 6 secant. So we can practice our our mastery rules on cosecant and secant. The other way we would do it would be 3 sine to the minus 1, so you'd have chain rule. You'd have chain rule, a power rule, sine to the minus 1, and cosine to the minus 1. But I'm going to do uh, secant and cosecant. So what's the derivative of cosecant? O derivative masters. Secant tangent, right? Remember? All right, so there's our first derivative. And we, we know we want to set that equal to zero. So now from this point, in order to, to solve this for zero, we want to change things back to sine and cosine. So it's a trade-off. Here we, we, here we just avoided chain rule. So if we wanted to go straight and keep it in sine and cosine the whole time, we would have had to chain rule, which is a little more work. So it's just a trade-off, but so we're, we want it to be zero. So zero equals. So this is going to be negative three cosine over sine squared, and this is going to be six sine over cosine squared by changing things back to sine and cosine. Is that zero equals or negative equals? Uh, which you tell me. What makes sense? Zero. Yeah, so theta doesn't equal f prime of theta, right? So, I'm, so, I'm so we, we're, setting, we're taking the derivative and setting it equal to zero. Setting it equal to zero. <clears throat> okay, and so then I'm going to move this to the other side. I'm going to add 3 cosine sine squared. And I'm going to uh, 
cross multiply. Can I do that all in the same step? So imagine adding this to both sides, moving it over, cross multiplying. I'm going to get 6 sine cubed equals 3 cosine cubed. Is it okay? So I added that negative term to both sides, and then I cross multiply. So I get 3 cosine cubed plus 6 sine cubed equals 6 sine cubed. And so then I get, and I'm going to move this over here. I'm going to divide by cosine cubed and divide by 6. Sine cubed divided by cosine cubed is tangent cubed. So I get, I'm going to get tangent cubed theta equals 3 over 6, or 1 half. And so then tangent theta is the cube root of one half. No, the cube root of one half is not one eighth. And so now our critical value is theta is the arctan of the cube root of one half. So what is this, this? That's the angle that we want. Whatever number that is, let's let's put it in the graphing calculator and see what that number is. A tan of one half to the one third. Point six seven zero nine radians. And so, last in these um, real world examples for angle, it you know degrees will give us a kind of a better idea of what we're talking about. So how do we do that to degrees? So we can take radians and divide by two pi, get a fraction of the circle, and then multiply by three sixty. 38.44 degrees. So we're expecting the angle 38.44. This is not, this A value is not angle, by the way. I'm just going to eyeball 38.44. Come on. So, I don't know. Something like that is 38. Some, somewhere around there, 38.44 is giving us the shortest ladder. How do we find the length of that ladder? So, how do we, well, now we want to find the length of the shortest ladder. Okay? Remember, what is our, what is our solution all about? It's all about this function, whose input is theta and whose output is what? Length of the ladder. So we've got the critical value is going to be the input value that gives us the optimal value of output. Or in other words, will give us the shortest ladder. So we're going to do 3 over a sine of the angle plus 6 over cosine of the angle will give us the, the shortest ladder. <laughs> So let's see here, what is that? Let's just copy this. And we'll do uh, 3 divided by sine of that plus 6 divided by cosine of that. 12.48 feet. Twelve point four eight six feet. Anybody have a question? So 
So what did I just do? I just used the function, right? 3 over sine of the, the critical value angle plus 6 over the cosine. So we didn't really check that that was indeed a local minimum, but we can argue that it is because it's the only critical value from 0 to pi over 2. And at the endpoints, that the values of the function are getting infinitely large. So if you have infinitely large at the endpoints, and then you have one critical value, it must be a minimum. It must be a minimum. Question? Uh huh. Yeah. I did what? Here, I, I divided by cosine cubed, and then I also divided both sides by six. So when I divided by cosine cubed on the left, I got tangent cubed. When I divided by six, I got three six. Yeah. So I just I did again did two steps at once there. Other questions? Yeah. Yep, yep, that was, that's the tangent inverse of cube root of one half, in degrees, in degrees, yep. Here, here it's, it's operating as uh, radians. It was like 0. 0.67 radians or something like that, yeah. Other questions? Hopefully this helps for process and trig. Last chance. Okay. And then keep coming into office hours and getting help. It's just there's, there's no way around this. You just got to work at it, get help, work at it some more, get help. There are, we know that all the problems are different, and we, we have only so much time in lecture and recitation to get through so many problems, and then the rest is up to you to, to get the help that you need. Okay? Last chance before I erase. So that top part function, the three over sine. Yep. Right, because it was L1 plus L2, and L1 I got using sine theta, the, the opposite over hypotenuse relationship. L2 I got from cosine theta, the adjacent over hypotenuse relationship, that was in blue over there. So then I substituted those in to change, get L1 in terms of theta, L2 in terms of theta. But yeah, L1 was the length up to the, up to the fence, L2 was from the fence to the building. And so our total length is just simply L1 plus L2, and then I'm rewriting them in terms of theta using the ratios, using the trig ratios. Okay. Did it answer it? Yeah, I'm going to go back and rewatch it. Yeah. So it, um, yeah, I've, I kind of lost that. Right, there's another question over here. In web work, if it, they ask for an angle in web work, it's going gonna, it's gonna to want radians, unless it says degrees. So if it doesn't specify in web work and it's asking for an angle measure, put in radians. And, and always use radians unless it says you're, you're using degrees. Yeah? Right. I added the negative fraction to the left, and I cross multiplied. So imagine this on the left, positive. Then I'm going to do that times that equals that times that. So 3 cosine cubed equals 6 sine cubed. Right? So here, I'll just I'll do it, right? So this, is, this right here is the same thing as this. And then I cross multiplied. Is it better? Yeah. Okay. Another question. Yeah. What's that? That's what I did. So that's what I did up there, right? Three over sine of what I got, or tangent of plus six over cosine of. That's exactly what you do. That's exactly. What, this, yeah. The function. So when we get into all this like derivative and all this algebra. Don't forget that there's still focused on the function. The function takes values of theta and gives length of the latter. So once we get that length, that theta that we want, we go back to the function and that's basically what I'm doing up there, is I'm evaluating the function at the angle that we found to get the 12.48 feet. Did I answer it?
Other questions? Okay. So let's move on. I'm going to erase. Last chance. Good questions. Here we go. Okay, so here's an equation and a curve. And so, a couple questions. First question is, when you see that curve, when you see that curve, what are you looking at? What are you looking at when you see that curve? Tell the person next to you. What are you looking at? It's precisely what are you looking at in that graph when, you look, when you're looking at that curve? What are you looking at? Okay, somebody new, what do you think? What are you looking at when you're looking at that curve right there? Jason, you're up. Because you have your headphones in. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a lot of points raised in a certain way to where I mean, some of you derive some differentiation. <laughs> So yeah, so so it's it's a set of points. You're looking at an infinite number of points. All right. So I'm going to highlight a point here, and I'm going to highlight a point here. And I want you to answer, talk to the person next to you. What's the difference between the blue point that I highlighted and the red point that I highlighted? Relative to this equation, right? So what's the difference between the blue point that I highlighted and the red point relative to this equation, x squared plus y cubed minus 2xy equals 7, which is the equation for the curve? Okay, go. Talk, tell the person next to you. Okay, somebody new. What's the difference between the blue point and the red point relative to the equation of the curve? I don't have my list. Yes? Okay, so you're talking about there's, there's an ordered pair associated with that blue point, say uh, p q, and what about those what about those values p q in this equation? Okay, so if you put, if you put p in for x and q in for y, what would happen? It would equal seven. It would work. The equation would be true. And then there's another point over here, <coughs> say M and N. <coughs> what happens if we put M in for X and N in for Y into the equation? What will happen? You won't get 7, right? The equation won't be true. So if that, if that curve is a set of all points, or if that curve is a set of points, what points are, is it? So how would we describe what points are all the points on that curve? All the points such that what? Somebody new. Adam, what do you think? All the points on the curve are all the points such that what? Yep, so all the points from the curve are all points such that 
What? Finish the sentence. Okay. Next one. What's your name? Jessica. Jessica. Yeah, so any all the points such that if you plugged in the x and y coordinates of the points, it would equal that expression would equal seven. And then any points that aren't on the curve won't equal seven. So the equation and the graph are mathematically the same because they both represent the same set of ordered pairs, x and y, that make the equation true. And then when plotted are the points that form the curve. Okay? So that's what we're looking at when we're looking at a graph. We're looking at all the point all points that make some, some relationship true, like this. So can we talk about is the set of ordered pairs, does it represent y as a function of x? You're saying no. Why not? Okay, you're looking at the equation. Yes. So, so she's looking at the equations and she's saying, uh, you don't plug in an x, you have to kind of plug in an x and a y. Okay, what about looking at the graph? Yes, sir? Well, if you plug in a value of x, you're going to get two values of y, which makes the combination. So look at here, like, right, this is x equals 3. And x equals 3. What is the definition of a function for every x? There's only one y that returns. It's predictable, right? It's a predictable relationship. Is this predictable? No, you get you get a point there. You get a point up here. And you get a point down here. All have different y values. <clears throat> so it is not y as a function of x, but is it valid to talk about the rate of change of y with respect to x? Is it valid to talk about the rate of change of y with respect to x? If y, y is not a function of x, but is it valid to talk about rate of change? Say right here. Is it valid to talk about rate of change right there? For a little change in x, is there a specific change in y? Right there. So right there, is it valid to talk about, right there at that point, is it valid to talk about rate of change of y with respect to x? Sure, yeah, sure, right? For a change in x, there's going to be some corresponding change in y that would form the rate of change. Okay, so but what about a rate function? So first of all, yeah, so at any point, y is changing at some specific, specific rate with respect to x. What about a rate function? So at x equals 3, is there a specific rate of change? No. All right. At There's not a specific rate of change at x equals 3, but on a point-by-point -point basis, there is rate of change, right? So if the input to the rate function was x, we wouldn't have a valid rate function because there's values of x I don't feel like everyone's paying attention. Can we kind of circle a little bit? Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> at, at x equals 3, OK, there's three different rates for x equals 3. So to have a rate function that's a function of x is impossible. But we can have a rate function that's a function of every individual point that we're at. Do you see that? So if we pick an, a specific point on the curve, then the rate is valid. But there's not a specific rate for every necessarily for every x value. Okay, so to talk about a rate function here, we can do it, but now the input we have to think of as ordered pairs, x and y taken together, not just a value of x. If we think of just a value of x, we have the same uh, problem we had before for every x there's more than one y, and there's more than one rate. But if we think of taking each ordered pair at a time, we can get a rate for every ordered pair. So in that way, we can think of a rate function. Okay? In that way, we can think of a rate function. 
<clears throat> so in order to determine this rate function, which is still dy dx, it's still the change in y for a change in x, we need to pretend that y is a function of x. Okay? We're going to pretend that we can write y is a function of x. Although we can't. Why? Because in these equations like this, y and x are like intertwined. They're like wrapped up and we can't, we can't get it to be y equals some function of x. But we pretend that that's possible. Okay? So in other words, y as a function of x is implied but doesn't necessarily exist. So there's this implication that we're going to have y as a function of x, but we kind of know that that would be impossible to really get the, get that, the true of the function. But we're going to imply that it's there. And so then what we need to do to get the rate function is what's called implicit differentiation. Implicit differentiation is based on an implied y as a function of x when it doesn't really exist because x and y are tied together. So let's explain how we can get, the, our goal is the rate function for something like this, from an equation like that. All right, so we've got this equation. We're still going to follow all our same mastery rules. And so we're going to start by taking the derivative, uh, so thinking of y as a function of x, right? We said that's what we're, we're pre pretending that y is a function of x. So everywhere there's a y, we can think, okay, there's some, there's some way to write y in terms of x. We're just, that's what's implied. And now we're going to take the derivative of both sides. So we're going to take the derivative of the left side and the derivative of the right side. And so on the left, we have a derivative of a sum or difference. So the derivative of a sum or difference is the derivative of the individual parts. Okay, so the derivative, so we're going to have basically the derivative of this sum or difference is the derivative of each individual thing. So what's the derivative of x squared with respect to x? Really easy, right? Okay, so now what's the derivative of a function of x cubed? What rule applies if we have a function of x cubed? What rule do we have to use? Chain rule, right? It's going to be power rule. 3, leave the inside the same, to the second times the rate of change to the inside. What's the rate of change to the inside? Well, we don't know what f of x is, so all we can write is f prime of x. Okay, next thing. So we have now the next thing we have is minus 2x times a function of x. How are we going to get the rate of change of that? Minus 2x times f of x. We need the product rule. We have a one product times uh, one function times another function. So we're going to do. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to. I'll take as my first minus 2x and as my second f of x. So derivative of the first is negative 2 times the second as it is. plus the first minus 2x times the derivative of the second, which is? Now that's just the left-hand side. Did you, did you follow that? So I had uh, an easy x derivative, then I had a chain rule, something cubed, I need the chain rule, then I had uh, a product rule, minus 2x times f of x. What about the right side? Equals derivative of a constant, zero. OK, did you, did you follow what we're doing here? So we're, ne we're not going to ever write, we're not going to solve for y and write y as a function of x. But we pretend that it's true, and we substitute f of x wherever there's a y. And then whenever we are uh, taking the derivative of f of x, we need the chain rule. We need the chain rule or product rule or whatever, whatever applies. OK. So what are we after? We're after dy dx. 
what here in our equation now is dy dx? Where, where do we see dy dx in that equation? Yeah. So this is our dy dx. So here's where we go from here. And this is, um, this is an important step, and that, um, students tend to forget this quickly. Every term that has that, every term that has a, a f prime of x, we're going to move it to the left side of the equation. And then every term that doesn't have an f prime of x, we're going to move it to the right. Our goal is to s solve for f prime of x. We're trying to get f prime of x by itself. So we're going to move all the terms that have an f prime of, prime of x to the left, all the terms that don't go to the right side of the equal sign. So on the left, we're going to have that first one, 3 f of x squared, f prime of x, minus 2x, f prime of x. So taking, keeping those on the left. Equals. And then everything else that doesn't have an f prime of x is going to go to the right. So we're going to have minus 2x. And what? Plus 2 f of x. Did you catch that? I've got four terms, that one, that one, and then these two. The ones that have the f prime of x that I put a squiggle under, those stay on the left. The ones I put a box under don't have an f prime of x, those move to the right. So now on the left, we can factor out the f prime of x and we're one step away from getting it. So f prime of x equals, or f prime of x times what? 3 f of x squared minus 2x equals Any, are you following it? Anybody have a question? We're one step away now. Our goal was to get the rate of change function. Our goal was to get the rate of change function. And that's what f prime of x is. So we're last step. Divide. Divide. So what did we call, what was f of x again? So we said f of x was from the beginning. Why did we inject f of x into this? <clears throat> it's just y, right? We were assuming, we're, we're implying or assuming that y is a function of x. So that's why we changed it. So now let's change it back. So anywhere there's an f of x, that's just simply equal to y. So if you want to write a new step, that's fine. I'm just going to erase and change it. So where there's a... <coughs> and if you want it, this is, this is synonymous with dy dx, right? So notice what we got. We got dy dx as a function of what? As a function of x? And y, right? And that's what we said. We said if we if we go pointwise and we and we have an ordered pair, that will uniquely determine a rate of change. And that's what this formula does. So now x equals three is not enough. If I put x equals three in here, well, it does not enough information. So what we need is also. If we want to know what the rate of change is when x equals 3, well, which x equals 3 are you talking about? Are you talking about when x equals 3 at this point, or at this point, or at this point? So the scales are even on here. I want you, with the person next to you, to just predict what the rate of change is at each of these. So this number 1, 
Number two, thinking about just without doing it, thinking about zooming in and for a, and for a little change in x, finding the change in y and coming up with that ratio, can you predict what those rates of change would be? And then we're going to actually get the ordered pairs and check them in the formula. So take a second and see if you can predict the rate of change at these three points. Go. <coughs> What's the, did you guys write down the equation? What was the equation? No, the, the function, the original equation. X squared plus what? And so what did we, uh, this is this first point, predictions for the rate of change, predictions for the rate of change here at this highest point where x equals 3. Anyone make a prediction for the rates? What's that? Okay, he said negative half. Any other possibilities? Negative a third. Is it negative or positive? They're both saying negative. Negative, your change in y is negative for a positive change in x, right? And so, what do we think? So how can we do it? For, know it for sure? So what I'll do is, I'm going to set up a function of two variables, because that's truly what our rate function is. What did we get again? We got negative, was it negative 2x plus 2y? Was that the numerator? Divided by? Do I have it right? Okay, so then I'm going to use that function and I'm going to evaluate it at the point. 3, plugging it. So what would you do? You plug in 3 for x and two, the, the corresponding y value at that point we were looking at, 2.2618 for y. And that this uh, function of now two variables, a function of x and y, will generate the rate of change at that, at that point. And we're thinking it's something like negative a half, negative a third. It's more like negative a sixth. Okay, that's that's kind of close to negative one sixth. Yeah. What does that mean? That the rate of change is negative one sixth. Tell the person next to you, what does it mean that the rate of change is negative one sixth? Go. Who knows?
Okay, Pierre, tell me. Okay, because you're on your smartphone. All right, how about in the corner? What's your name? Yeah. Melissa, did you, what does the negative one six mean for the rate of change? Okay, so if we're given a change in x, close, a small change in x close to that point, what's true? Can you finish it? Given a small change in x close to that point, not sure. Next one, what's your name? Was it? Summer. Tell me what the meaning is of negative one sixth, the rate of change. Not sure? At the end, what's your name? Was it? Julie. What's the meaning of the rate of change, negative one sixth? For any, that sounded like for any x value, the y value would be negative one sixth. Not quite. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so she nailed it. So she said, for any small change in x around 3, or around this point, the corresponding change in y would be this many times that change in x. Negative 1.58 so or so times the change in x is the change in y that you would get. So given a small change in x, this change in y would be negative 0.157, etc., 9 times that change in x. <coughs> rate of change, rate of change. Let's do one more. Okay, this is an easier one. This, so this one down here at this three. What do you? One. What do you estimate for the rate of change here? What do you estimate for the rate of change right there? For any change in x, the change in y would be? What do you think? Given a change in x, change in y would be how many times that change in x? About one, right? It's about the same. So let's try it. So what point is this? 3 and about 0.33. There it is. So when I put in that point, that ordered pair, 3 and 0.33, which is that ordered pair in the curve, I get a, a rate of change close to 1. Close to 1. So now for these, these equations where you can't kind of, you can't get y out and get y as a function of x, we need to use this implicit differentiation. And then our rate function then is, becomes a function of both y and x. We need the, all the information about the point, y and x, to get the associated rate, not just x. Okay, let's do another one. So, so these, uh, These, are function, these functions can generate some pretty crazy curves. <laughs> okay, but the meaning is the same. So when you're looking at all these points that are on all these curves, what are all those points that you're looking at? Tell the person next to you. What You're looking at a bunch of points. On the, they're on kind of isolated curves, but every single point on all those curves has something special about it. Tell the person next to you. Okay, somebody new. So all these points that we're looking at, all these 
these different curves, are, what's special about them? Yeah. Yeah, that, so that each point, the x and y coordinate from each of those points that you're looking at, make that thing true. Okay? So we're going we're gonna to get a rate function for this. We're going to get a rate function. So given any of those points, given any point that we take on the curve, we, need, we want the rate of change. Okay, we want the rate of change. So say like right here at 24, what would you predict this point right here? What, what would you predict its rate of change at that point right there? Pretty close to zero, right? Pretty close to zero. It looks like a local maximum. Okay, so let's do it. Here we go. So we're going to do the rate of change of each side. So we're going to do the rate of change of that. And the rate of change of that. So on the left, we have a difference. The first term is a constant multiple times sine. But it's chain rule because it's sine of x minus y. So rather than change all the y's to f of x's, which is a little more writing, we're just going to keep them as y's. And every time we have a y, we see it as a function of x. We, it's implied it's a function of x. We imagine it as a function of x. Okay? So we'll leave it as y. So what's the derivative of 75 sine x minus y? What's the derivative? It's going to be 75 cosine x minus y. Are we done? No. Chain rule. Chain rule times rate of change to the inside, which is? 1 minus dy over dx. dy dx. And for, for ease sake, we'll call it y prime. Okay, next term. 3y squared x. Product rule. So I'll call minus 3y squared the first. So derivative of the first is? Uh, 6y uh, Remember, y is a function of x. So this is, when we do the derivative of the first, that's actually chain rule, right? Because it's 3 times a function of x squared. So it'll be 6y times y prime. Before, in the first example, you wrote that as 6f of x times f prime x. Okay, well, that was just the derivative of the first. So derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. Derivative of the second is just 1. So there's product rule on 3y squared x. Anytime you take a derivative of y, <coughs> y is implied as a function of x, you need the chain rule. So we, that's why we did the y, 6y times y prime. Okay, other side. <coughs> derivative of e to the xy. Derivative of e to the something is e to the something now, times the product rule of this, right? Times the product rule of x times y. Derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. That would have fit up there. Plus the first times the derivative of the second. Plus the derivative of minus 67, which is? Zero. Questions on this first step? Apply, we're applying the rules as before. Whenever you have a y, you think of it as a function of x and use the chain rule whenever you take the derivative of that. So how many terms do we have? So over here, we end up with e to the xy times y plus e to the xy xy prime. This is actually two terms. Why? Because, <clears throat> because we have this subtraction right here. So this becomes 75 cosine x minus y times 1 minus 75 cosine xy x minus y times y prime. So 
So how many total terms do we have? So when we get these really ugly, nasty ones, you've got to see how many separate terms you have. So I will, let's put a, a red circle around the ones that have y primes. There's one. There's two. So this is there. This is there still. Okay, so. And this one. So these are the three that have a y prime, those three terms. The rest do not. This one, this one, and this one. So the ones I've circled red, they have a y prime or a uh, dy dx. They're going to go to the left side. They're going to go all to the left side. All the ones that don't have a y prime, blue, going to go to the right side because we're trying to solve for y prime. We want, we want to get the rate function. So here we go. So we're going to have 75 on the left, all the ones that have a y prime. To the right, all the ones that don't. Those are the ones I've scribbled in blue. Check my math. Check my math, please. Can I factor out and divide in one step? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to these all have a y prime. So I'm going to factor out the y prime and then imagine that I have these terms without the y prime and then whatever's in parentheses is going to get divided on this side. So the numerator will be 75 cosine x minus y plus 3y squared plus e to the xyy all over what's left on the left what remains in the left after I factor out the y prime so it's negative 75 cosine x minus y minus 6yx <clears throat> That's fourteen, not twenty four. All right, so here's the point fourteen. Point three four six seven something. Six two. There's that point. And if we did all the math right and we plug in fourteen for x and point three four six seven six two for y, what do we expect that to give us? Something close to zero. It looks like the rate of change is pretty close to zero at x equals 14. So that <coughs> this function would tell us exactly what the rate of change is at that point on the curve. <coughs> 